All right, joining us on another wrestling podcast today, uh, it's someone who prides himself on being a straight shooter. Uh, he calls it like he sees it. He uh, he shoots from the hip. He's Frank. Uh, actually, he's Bull. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bull James. Thanks so much for joining us today. How's it going? Good, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. Now, you've been on a roll as of late. You just came off a big weekend with uh, for House of Hardcore, where you faced off against Eddie Kingston and former teacher Billy Gunn. But what fans might not know is that you were actually on the very first House of Hardcore show. Uh, what, did you, what did you do? From back before I signed with WWE, I was actually uh, the uh, mini roadkill at the first ever House of Hardcore show. Little, little known House of Hardcore trivia fact for you. Wow. There you go. There you go. Learn something new each week, Jonathan. Absolutely. See that? I'm, I'm just here to inform, guys. That's what I do. <laughs> That's right. But no, man, House of Hardcore is uh, it's a lot of fun. And I know like a lot of people were coming up to me, a lot of fans, and asking me, you know, what's the next step for you? Where are you going to go? And quite honestly, uh, Tommy's a guy who has always had my back. He's always been supportive of me. And... um you know, I have no problem calling House of Hardcore my home because it, it, it does feel that way, and, and I view it as my home because it, it's just the right people in charge and the right guys on the show and um, just amazing fans all around. It's just it's the right thing for the business, and I think um, I think it's only the beginning for House of Hardcore. Well, we, uh, we love having them in our uh, backyard. We are also based on the Northeast, so we are looking forward to a lot of uh, – future House of Hardcore shows, and we, we can't wait to see you there as well. But you also made some headlines at one of these shows this weekend. Um, you, you locked lips uh, with a friend of ours, Felicia Rose. How did that come about, and is there anything you want to say to Felicia tonight? Uh, well, you know, just uh, I want to say, hey, what's up? And, uh, you know, it, some things happen sometimes. You know, you're out there and you see something, something catches your eye, like a, like a sign, a very suggestive sign. <laughs> and uh you know hey you just come sometimes you just act on it you get a feel you got feeling and you act on it and that's kind of what makes this industry so special is we, and it's, that's what makes house of hardcore so special is maybe beforehand if that sign was in the audience somewhere else let's say um i wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to just go with my gut instinct and do something like that but because it was house of hardcore and because um i am in the position i'm in now screw it <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, let's let's give some, you know, let's give people something they're going to remember. Of course. And uh, you know, just told uh, told Eddie Kingston, hey, uh, hang on one second, I got to do something. <laughs> There you go. Uh, now, uh, Bull, you know, we, we always like to get a little bit of like uh, somewhat of an origin story, to you, a story of uh, how everyone got into the business. But, uh, you know, where did you grow up and, uh, you know, how, you know, basically did you start getting into wrestling? Uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, basically I was working a dead end job and a guy in the loading dock was doing some indie wrestling. And I went and checked out a show he was on and signed up started training that was really it 17 years old and i knew what i wanted to do so i went and did it now prior to that i mean you're obviously familiar with professional wrestling did you uh did you have any specific favorites that you really liked as you were growing up i mean everybody does but it, it, it's always the same you know it's always the hogan's and the austin's and dx and the rock and you know whatever the top guy is really right the flavor the flavor of that era, I guess you could say. And, um, you know, so growing up as a fan, you know, it's always going to be one of those guys, but then as you, you know, get in the industry and mature in the industry, there's so many people that influence me and either from personal experiences with them or just from being fans of what they did, you know, like Terry Funk and Bruiser Brody and Fit Finley and William Regal and Norman Smiley and Robbie Brookside, all these guys. Um, you just, you take what you can from everybody. You just, you gotta be open-minded to, to everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, now you were uh, trained in part by Taz. Uh, did you feel that you were someone who caught on quickly to training or did you, uh, or did it take a while to get into the groove? Well, I was, I was trained already when I got to Taz's school. His school was a finishing school at that point. And it was uh, basically guys with some experience and it was him polishing them up and getting them ready for that next level. Mm -hmm. So, I had a good base uh, underneath me. There was a lot of guys local to the area, you know, uh, Danny Doring and Judas Young, Danny Inferno, Kodiak Bear, guys like that, and then um, fell into the hands of Matt Bourne by the grace of God, and 
he um, he helped me out tremendously. And then from there, went on to Taz's school and got even more of a learning experience from somebody else who had been there and done that. So I was very fortunate to be in the hands of the right people all along the way. Now, you know, whenever you first started, like you said, you were at that dead end job and you were looking to to make a change. Whenever you got into professional wrestling, at any point did you start to question that career choice, or were you just happy to not be doing what you were doing? Uh, no, I, I think it's just um, you know, obviously you get frustrated if things aren't going the way you want them to. But I just I knew, you know, I'm going to do this. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when, but it's going to happen. And I think when you put those blinders on and you just go balls to the wall, then, you know, nobody can look down on you for that. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, as of late, a lot of injuries going around in the world of professional wrestling. Uh, did you have any injuries early on in your career that you could probably tell us about? Uh, knock on wood, the only injury that caused me to miss any time was a separated shoulder when I first got to NXT and I was out for maybe like three weeks. Oh. But uh, thankfully, hopefully, you know, I'm not jinxing myself here. I'm knocking on some wood now. Uh, of course, <laughs> That's the worst of it, so. Okay. Now, I've, been, uh, I've been very fortunate in that department as well. No, that's awesome. We're uh, glad to hear that. But after uh, after a while, you know, you started getting out there. You started working on the independence, the independent scene. And uh, you're currently, you know, working on the independent scene. Um, some times went by in between those those parts of your career. Uh, do you see any major differences between the independent wrestling scene then and now? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think, um, and it's good and bad right now. A lot of people are doing a lot of good business and there's a lot more, uh, it's a lot more organized than it once was. Um, promoters have their heads on a little more straight instead of just throwing whatever they want out there. Like everything is, everything's cohesive and everybody's working together. There's no more, I mean, it's still there sometimes, but there's no more of these like turf wars that don't make any sense, you know? Sure. Yeah. And I think just uh, as far as talent goes, like, there's a lot of talented guys coming up that just need that guidance. Mm-hmm. And but at the same time, I think they maybe need to seek it out a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of sense of entitlement with a lot of guys that have maybe been in the business for like a year or two. And I know when I was breaking in, that would have never flown, you know. Sure. Now, you know, you're still early on in your career, but uh, what are some of your highlights, I guess uh, you would call them? Anything that stands out above the rest? I mean, I'm always going to look at Barclays and, um, you know, being in front of my hometown crowd and my parents in the front row, you know, I'll always have that. And nobody can take that away from me. Um, Blackpool and the NXT UK tour was definitely a highlight. Um, but there's, there's highlights for different reasons. Like there's times where I got to wrestle Matt Bourne before he passed and I'll always cherish those moments or step in the ring with somebody like Danny Doring, who to this day is my, one of my best friends. You know, I'll always have those things. There's always going to be, things that are special for obvious reasons like Barclays or something like that. But then there's always those really sentimental moments too, where maybe to somebody else, it was just another match or just another show I was on. But to me, it was special for a certain reason. Okay. Now we, we talked about some of the places that you have wrestled already, CZW, uh, house of hardcore. Um, but there's a lot of wrestling talent on the independent scene right now. Um, is there anybody that you haven't got to, the chance to kind of face that you're hoping that maybe someone's listening right now and they can say, all right, we're going to, we're going to make this match happen. Is there anybody that you're just itching to work with? Um, I would have said Eddie Kingston, but Tommy beat everybody with a punch on that one. Um, maybe homicide. Now that he's back and healthy. Cause I've, you know, I've been around him for years, but we never actually got to, to wrestle each other. Um, just trying to think out loud, uh, you know, the young bucks, obviously, cause I always said it, you know, and maybe I didn't get to wrestle against Finn Balor or Sami Zayn or Apollo Crews or those top guys in NXT. I teamed with a lot of them, but, um, you know, if you, if you want to be the best, you got to prove yourself against the best. And I think those guys have carved themselves out of niche as being the best on the independents right now, whether it's through their work or, or it's through, um, their fan base or whatever the case is, I would, you know, if you, if you want to be a top dog and go where the top dogs are. So I think it's only, it only makes sense for me to want to wrestle some, you know, guys like that. Sure. Uh, now, uh, you've been wrestling for a while uh, in training. Uh, after, well, long story short, after wrestling and training for a while, uh, you got signed by the WWE. You went to NXT. Um, what were your initial thoughts of uh, how WWE does things now, especially with uh, the training center and all that stuff? 
Well, I mean, it's hard, but it's rigorous and it's every day and it's a grind. But at the end of the day, you walk out of there a machine, you know, that you can go in the ring. There's nobody that can blow you up. There's nobody that can do anything to you that you don't want to be done to you. Um, and then on the flip side, you know, as far as making your shots and being professional, being on time, um, it's, it's just, you, you learn everything that you need to learn to be successful, not just in the wrestling industry, but in life, you're overprepared for any situation that life throws at you. One of the cool things that I saw, you said that you had, um, earned a scholarship to, you know, the greatest wrestling school in the world, uh, being down there. But while you were at the performance center, how much feedback were you getting? Was it constant or did you kind of have to seek it out or were there people, you know, telling you all the time? You were getting feedback every minute of every day from That's, whoever was there. Then, so and like, it's uh, still that way, and, and I think that'll never change. And I mean, as as a performer, that's something that I mean, you you obviously want you want that kind of to know what's going on. But did you feel like that there was anything that you specifically when you got there struggled with, or were you? You know, you went through a lot of training, so you were probably pretty good. But personally, was there anything that you thought that you learned a lot at NXT? I, I just think it was a matter of being patient and just knowing, all right, my time's going to come. It's just a matter of when. And, you know, you're always, you have to always be open to, learn, to learning and wanting to learn. Like if I'm an actor and, you know, I get a chance to be in a movie with Robert De Niro and I decide, well, I'm just going to sit over here and let him do his thing and, I'll just read my lines when it's my turn to read my lines. You're not going to go anywhere. You know, you need to go up to that guy and ask him questions and pick his brain because he's been there, done that, and, and done everything there is to do. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you're around people that are better than you, 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 you have to latch on to those people. You know, you have to learn from them. Sure. Now, did you enjoy, enjoy taking those promo classes? I, I've seen a lot of them uh, behind the scenes stuff. Uh, was it kind of different than anything you've ever you know, were taught before? Yeah, I mean, it was it was more just being around Dusty and learning from him. It was was the best part of it, you know. And um, when guys like Regal would come down, you know, obviously you can learn a ton from him, and uh, he's just amazing at what he does. But being around Dusty was just incredible, and I'm always thankful for for having that, you know, because a lot of people now will never get that opportunity. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's it's one of those things where he just changes the way you look at things, and you just you get a different perspective on something that nobody else in that company really can give you, you know, it's not, it's, it's a perspective that's different from everybody else that works there. And from a guy that literally was on top of the wrestling industry for how many years, you know, and it's, and then on top of that was just his own person. You know, he was just a special, special guy. Now you, you came into NXT, you were kind of one character. And then as you, uh, were getting some footing and people were backing you, you kind of changed characters. Um, who were some of the driving forces behind the actual change to the bull fit character? I think it was just a collective, a collective agreement that was made in a direction that the company wanted to go in. So, you know, your job is just to show up with a smile on your face every day and do your job to the best of your ability. And if you commit, commit to something and make it work, that's your job. You know, it's very easy to sit there and go, oh, you want me to do this stupid thing? I'm not going to do it. Okay, well, then they'll find somebody else to do it. Mm-hmm. But if you show up, do what's asked of you, and do it the best you can and make it work, then you're going to stick around for a little while. And I was lucky enough to have almost three years there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, uh, you know, while you were in NXT, you were also uh, people were getting called up to the main roster. Did you see people that got called up that were maybe apprehensive to go because they saw what happened to other people that got called up? Was there anything like that or no? No, I don't think so. At the end of the day, you know, that's that's the goal. Yeah. The goal is to get to that Raw or that SmackDown roster. Like, yeah, NXT is its own brand, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's a business, and you want to feed your family, and you want to put away as much money as you can in the quickest amount of time. And I think if your goal isn't to be on that level that those guys are now getting to be at, and then, by the way, I'm proud of those guys, and I'm so happy for all of them because they've all worked their asses off. But, you know, if, if that's not your goal, then you're in the wrong business. Now, there's a lot of people that are in NXT. We just mentioned some of them have been called up. Um, is there anybody down there, either right now or people that are on the main roster, that you feel like don't get the credit that they deserve, whether it's in a training capacity, a wrestling capacity? Is there anybody that you just think that you know 
is a lot better than people give him credit for. Uh, yeah, I mean, Ty Dillinger, but I think everybody says that, so maybe he is getting the credit he deserves. Uh, but he's a phenomenal talent. Uh, Wesley Blake is another one just absolutely incredible. Um, man, I'm, just trying to think, I'm trying to go around like the locker on the top of my head. Um, I'm, I'm going to miss people, and they're going to get mad at me, but it happens. <laughs> Uh, Riddick Moss is a guy with a huge upside who I think has a really bright future. You know, he could talk, he could walk. He's got the look. I think he's going to do really well. Um, there's a guy down there now, Jim Salmani, who's, uh, was an MMA fighter from Albania and the Netherlands. And he's, uh, he's like 21 years old and he's built like a house and he can move and he's got a good attitude and he works hard. I think he's, you know, if he sticks with it, I think he's going to do really well. Uh, I think ZZ is going to be the next ten-time WWE champion. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm trying to think who else is around there. I don't know. It's it's it just sucks not having like everybody in front of me because it's I can I can rattle off things, but I can rattle off things about everybody there. That's the cool part of that place. Mm. I can sit here and, and walk through that whole locker room. Hugo Knox, another guy who I think is going to do really well. But uh, and you know it just it pops in your head. But I, I just I can say something about everybody there as to why they should be there and what they bring to the table. Sure. Now and that's that's the that's the really really cool part about that place. Now at the end of the day, uh, what was probably the most important thing you learned uh, while you're down there? Uh, it's so hard to narrow it down to one thing because you're learning a million things every day. Mm. You know, I think it's just. Um, it, it goes back to stuff that I learned when I was first breaking in. It's just staying humble and doing the right thing and being a good person. I think that's what it all boils down to. Now, you're I, what I would consider a big man in the world of, of professional wrestling. Um, who do you consider some of your favorite big men in the world of professional wrestling? Uh, I think Bam Bam is always going to be on that list. But it depends on you know what kind of what, what their style is, what what I'm watching for on that day. I mean, I'm going to say Dusty and Dick Murdoch, obviously, and Adrian Adonis and Bruce Brody, you know, and Doctor Death and Cox. And I, you know, I can rattle off just list the guys, and then I got a tape to my parents' basement that they probably want to kill me for still having. <laughs> but. You know, it's just, you, know, you just got to soak up everything you can from every guy. And then to narrow it down for, to one person, I mean, you know, you can take something from everybody. And I think that's the beauty of what we do. Now, there's there's one thing that kind of I, I was confused about, and it was happening whenever Kevin Owens kind of first came on the scene in the WWE. And um, it seemed like the announcers were, were saying stuff about his weight, and Randy Orton even made some cracks about his weight. Um do you, I mean, do you think that that was a way of like trying to like body shame him or I just, as, as a fan, I just don't really understand it because, you know, obviously he can move around. It's just like, you know, like you said, like Bam Bam and some of these guys, uh, they, they can all move around. I just wasn't really sure. And maybe you're not, you didn't know that that was happening or whatever, but I mean, I, I heard people, I heard people bitch about it, but. You know, I mean, they did it to me on NXT pre-tape one, so who cares? You know, yeah. and then even when they start, even when we started doing the bullshit videos and everything, people, oh, they're body shaming. Like it's entertainment. Take it for what it is. Like, yeah. It, it's it's a I, well, the first vignette we did, I thought was hilarious. Even if I wasn't yeah. in it, I would have laughed at it. <laughs> you know, and I and that that got me the most feedback on on social media from the boys from everything. It's just because it was just totally a 180 from everything I was doing. And it was funny. And if you just take stuff for what it is and stop trying to make a thing out of every little thing, <laughs> yep. That like it, and you know, people are so quick to do that. And you know what? Even if they are trying to body shame Kevin, then Kevin needs to go out there and stick it up their ass. Mm -hmm. That's what. That, that's just the way it is. You prove them wrong, and it's just it's so. I don't. Know, I just I hate the politically correct. Just oh, they're body shaming. Them. They can't talk about them like that. No. Yeah, you know, you're getting like when I was getting bullied as a kid. You know what got him to stop? When I punched him in the face, it wasn't going to run into a teacher. It wasn't taking anti-bullying classes. I went and I punched the kid in the face, and he stopped making fun of me. <laughs> so go out there, stick it up their ass, show them why they're wrong, and show them why you deserve to be there. 
And at the end of the day, that's all you can do. And as long as you can look yourself in the mirror that, you know, at the end of each day and when you wake up in the morning, you're doing the right thing. Awesome. Now, uh, Friday, April 29th, uh, Survivor Slam at Avenel, New Jersey. Uh, pro- proceeds were going to benefit the American Cancer Society. Uh, ESS Promotions is going to be bringing in Paul James. Uh, for people who may not be familiar with you, what can the fans expect that night, Paul? Uh, you can expect a hard-hitting competitor. You can expect a guy who's going to make you laugh, make you cry, make you feel everything he's doing. Um, I'll be there that night. I'll also be at Five Borough Wrestling that night. And then the next day, I'll be doing a signing at the Wrestling Universe in Queens. And I will be competing at WrestlePro in New Jersey and MYWC on Long Island. So that's a jam-packed weekend for me. And I think it's um, just a testament to, you know, my work ethic and what I can bring to the table somewhere. And I'm really looking forward to, to the future. Awesome. Well, obviously in the world uh, today, it's pretty much driven by social media. Uh, where can fans keep up with you on social media these days? Uh, my Twitter handle is still at bull Dempsey WWE, which will soon be changing to at real bull James. Once uh, whoever's working on that works on it and gets it done, I can keep my verification because that's important nowadays. Uh, and I'm also on Instagram at the Bull James or the Bull James, whatever you want to say it. And um, I think that's it. Yeah, right. Twitter, Instagram, those are the two big ones. Anything else out there that you want to plug? Uh, feel free. Uh, no, just prowrestlingtees.com slash bull. And uh, to anybody out there who has supported me along the way, um, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart because without the fans, we're nothing. All right. Well, Bull James, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we can't wait to see you on April 29th. Thank you, guys. Can't wait.